Hello, and welcome to the midweek message, the Bible study that we do in preparation for the Sunday message. My name is Nancy Gillard, and I'm the pastor at First Presbyterian Church in Clinton, Missouri. So glad to have you join us for these midweek messages. I want to let you know that upcoming for our church, this Sunday is the 23rd, and we'll be studying this passage in Matthew 16, 13 through 20. But the next week is August the 30th, and if you want to come and join us, we'll be having uh, muffins at our drive-in service. So it's our special way of offering a little hospitality to people that come to the drive-in service. And if you come to the service, it'll be just like what you've um, been coming to since May. You'll get your Ziploc bag that's full of the church bulletin and prayer requests, scriptures, songs, all those things. But then as you drive forward a little bit, you're going to get a homemade muffin. Melinda Dean is making these in her home kitchen, in her um, inspected kitchen. So it's a commercial kitchen. So it's going to be wonderful, and we are looking forward to it. Please join us. We are at the corner of 3rd and Franklin here in Clinton, Missouri. So as I mentioned earlier, our scripture comes from Matthew 16, and we'll be studying verses 13 through 20. If you'll please bow your heads, we'll enter into prayer and prepare our hearts for God's word. Let's pray. Almighty God, we do ask that you would be with us in this time as we are looking at your holy word. Lord, oftentimes we look at the words and we want everything to apply to us personally. But please remind us, Lord, that these are your words for an, for an entire world. That the words that you share are the profound understandings of Jesus Christ for the people of Christ so that we can continue as the church to share the good news of the gospel through Jesus' word. Help us, Lord, open our hearts and our minds, and we pray these things in your Son's name. Amen. All right, here we go. This scripture comes from Matthew 16, 19, uh, 16, 13 through 20. Now, when Jesus came to the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do the people say the Son of Man is? And they say, some say John the Baptist, but others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father in heaven. And I tell you. You are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. At our Zoom Bible study this morning, I told those folks that were there that this is a very famous passage. And as pastors, we preach on this passage a lot. I mentioned to uh, those that were at the Zoom Bible study that in my 33 years of preaching, the most often what I preach, uh, the most numerous, the number of times Number one would be the Christmas narrative. Number two is Pentecost. Certainly in there is uh, Easter, but Easter is scattered throughout all, th all four of the Gospels, as well as some of the epistles. So it's not exactly the passage that gets preached over and over again. But you know, Pentecost is always that, um, the, that chapter and verse from Acts 2. The third that I, that I, over the years, have preached on the most often is this passage from Matthew 16, 13 through 20. This passage that has several different parts to it. Certainly it is Jesus again. He's traveling. 
we hear him, he is speaking to the disciples. Then he is speaking to an uh, Peter, Simon, directly responds to Jesus with his confession. Jesus then recognizes Peter's strength and Peter's faith. And then um, Jesus speaks very clearly, not just about Peter's faith, but about the future of that faith. And then he speaks about the church. So that really is the motion. That's the activity of these verses as you read through them. Let me review those a little bit. Start up at the top. Jesus talks about, or we see Jesus and he is on the move again. Last week, Jesus was in the vicinity of Tyre and Sidon. Sidon, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing those correctly. And both of those cities are on the Mediterranean Sea. Beautiful locations. And both that vicinity would have been a very commercial vicinity. But now Jesus walks due east from Sidon. And we find him in Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea Philippi is a city that has been named several times over and over and over again. At this point, one of the Herods, so I think this actually is Herod the Great's grandson. Maybe it's a brother. Anyways, it's one of the Herods. This Herod has renamed this city. This city is on the slope of the mountain, so they're not close to the sea. They're now on a mountain slope. Once again, it is a commercial city because of the traffic, the travelers that are coming from the east to the west, and they come down this slope, down this passage through the mountains, particularly to Caesarea Philippi. Uh, Caesarea just gives us the, the um, title Caesar, so it's an important enough city that they can dedicate it to Caesar. And Philippi is one of the local government um, officials. His name's Philip. So they name it Caesarea Philippi. Once again, this particular city, the names get changed often. And then we have the disciples. They have gathered together and Jesus asks them, who do you say that I am? And they give him a variety of answers. The disciples say uh, a, a variety of different things. But they never really answer his question, do they? He says, who do you say that I am? And they never really give him an answer. I want to look back for just a second at Matthew 14, 22 through 23. Because this is the last time that Jesus really is exclusively with his disciples. And he's speaking exclusively to the disciples. Matthew 14, 22, 23 is just after... Peter has been on a walk on the water with Jesus. Peter's faith begins to fail. and Jesus lifts him up out of the water, says, O oh, you of little faith. And Jesus and Peter get back into the boat. The disciples in one voice in a community say, Surely this is the Son of God. This is the Messiah. The reason I point this out is because in English, we only have one word, you. But it's both in the plural. We can have you plural, speaking about a crowd of people, or you singular, speaking about the individual. In this particular passage, what theologically we need to look at is, who is Jesus speaking to? Is he speaking to you all the disciples, and they give him all the answers that they give him where they say, Elijah and Jeremiah and John the Baptist. So that's what they do. They speak to him. He says, he speaks to them and says, who's the Messiah? Who do you say? And then he looks at Peter and says, who do you say that I am? It's hard to know from this passage, and I've been doing a little bit of work through exegesis, through looking back at the Greek, to figure out when Jesus is talking to the plural and when Jesus is talking to the individual. But regardless of when you changes from plural to singular, the, the message that we get from the scripture is Jesus looking at the individual saying, who do you say that I am? 
And certainly that's an important theological moment in Scripture. And it's an important moment for us as Christians. When Jesus looks into our lives, when Jesus looks at us and says, Nancy, who do you say that I am? What is my response? My response is, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. That's my response. But for other people, the response may be different. They may not want to con uh, completely give themselves over to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. They would not be able to look Jesus and answer that question, who do you say I am? But here's Peter. And when Jesus connects with him individually, one-on-one, -on -one, who do you say that I am? Peter gives this wonderful testimony. You are the Messiah. And Jesus recognizes Peter's ability to stand up to the pressure of what everyone, whether it's just the disciples, whether it's everyone that he's been talking to in the crowd, regardless of what that is, when Jesus looks him in the eye and says, who do you say that I am? Peter takes on that strength of leadership. Jesus recognizes it. The disciples recognize it. And when Jesus, Jesus says, you now are Peter. Peter is the Hebrew word that sounds close to rock, petros, rock. It is a close word also. Sometimes you've heard Peter called Cephas. Cephas is the Aramaic, which is ka or kaphas. And um, when you translate the Aramaic into Greek, you get Cephas. So both of those words, which mean rock. And upon you, I will build my church. Now, only twice in Matthew do we have the word ecclesia, church. It makes us think that Matthew's gospel probably was written a little later in the life of Peter and the disciples because churches were beginning to be found and created. Before the uh, new Christian movement was coming about immediately after Jesus's resurrection, the uh, disciples only knew about synagogue. They only knew about temple. So here they are now. They are talking about Cephas, Petros, Peter being the rock, and upon this I will build my ecclesia church. So all those things come together. Let me just do a little bit more Bible study with you because I think these things are interesting. First of all, John Calvin, a great uh, founding father of the Presbyterian Church and really the Protestant movement, he looks at this idea of Peter being the rock. And Calvin has lived through the Protestant revol Revolution where there has been the split from the Roman Catholic Church so John Calvin is trying to understand what does this mean? Because for the Roman Catholics, Peter then becomes the bishop of Rome, the first pope. And from that lineage, we have our current day pope, the pope that, um, that makes statements. That's, those statements are then heard from the cardinals, the archbishops, the bishops, down to the priest. And what the pope says is from uh, our Lord Jesus Christ. That's a Catholic understanding that starts at this verse, Peter, you are the rock, and upon you I will build my church. But what John Calvin says, and what most Protestants would say about this particular verse, is that the rock is not Peter, but Peter's testimony. The rock is not an individual person, but it is his ability to say, you are the Messiah. It is his faithfulness to say, you are the Messiah. You are the one we've been waiting for. You are the Savior. You are the one that saves us from our sin, that loves us when we are unlovely, that gives us life abundant and life eternal, and the one that saves us from our sin. It is Peter's testimony that is the rock, the foundation of our faith more so than Peter, that human man, being the first of many that will become bishops and, um, and popes in the Roman Catholic Church. That word rock can also be seen as bedrock. What is the bedrock of our faith? It should be Jesus and Jesus Christ alone. 
rather than seeing that the rock is Peter and he now has a role in the church. So we would say that, um, and I believe that this particular passage shows Peter as my example to have faith, even when it's difficult. I mean, not long ago in Matthew 14, Jesus pulls Peter out of the water and says, Oh, ye of little faith. Peter, you tried to walk on water out to me. You sank. I'm going to pull you out of here so you don't drown. But Jesus says, Oh, ye of little faith. Here we have Peter, and he has great faith. So much faith that God says, This is a model. This is the model, the bedrock. And the bedrock is our ability to say, Jesus is my Lord. Jesus is my Savior. That's the bedrock of our faith. Let me also mention to you that I've always found it to be very confusing when Jesus talks to Peter and says, what you bind in heaven, how does that go exactly? I want to get this right. Um, I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. And these words are rabbinical words. I just found this information. I thought it was very helpful. That when the rabbis are talking about binding and loosing, they are talking about binding what is right in the Torah, in the law, in those um, uh, statements in the law of things that the Jews should follow, and loosing or letting loose, letting go of things from the law that no longer are part of Jesus' message. So Jesus' message that Peter binds or that he holds on to, he um, insists continue to be held on to, are uh, things that Jesus talks about. Certainly you remember when the Pharisees were asking Jesus a question and they said, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and your neighbor as yourself. That was the law that Jesus was going to bind and tell each of us that we are bound to. And then certainly we have seen laws, particularly as of last week, the fact that Jesus changes the law. Uh, last week we talked about how Jesus was not necessarily going to be held fast by the old laws, but that he was able to change his mind and to uh, reach out to one that was hurting, one that needed healing, simply because she was a woman of great faith. I'd really encourage you to look back at Sunday's sermon, listen to that about this woman of great faith. For Jesus, just like today, just like we've been seeing constantly through Matthew, the question is always about faith. Do you have faith in Jesus Christ? Jesus looks at Peter and he says, you got it. You got it. And on you, I will, and on your confession, I will instruct everyone about the bedrock of our faith, which is to believe in Jesus Christ. Um, and I, I love the image of Jesus giving Peter the keys to the kingdom of heaven. What a great image. We also are God's people. When we get to heaven as believers in Jesus Christ, we will come under judgment because God is a judge. That is what God the creator does. He is a judge. However, as believers in Jesus Christ, as those who come to the kingdom and say, Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. You are the Messiah. We have the keys. We have the keys to the kingdom. And we can just unlock the gate, go on in. Um, there's a scripture in Ephesians, uh, in Romans, that says, At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Jesus Christ must be our Savior. He must be the one that we bow our knee to. And I promise you, friends, we're either going to bow our knee to Jesus Christ now and call him Savior and Messiah today, or we will do it when we come before judgment and before the judgment of God Almighty. 
I'm going to encourage you to make that decision, to bow your knee today, to bow your head in humility and say, Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior, and to follow him as a, as a disciple of Jesus Christ. I promise you, in Christ is hope and future and a blessing. I hope that you'll take that challenge. I hope that you'll pray that Jesus Christ will be part of your life and part of what you live um, into, into this world, into the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Let's close with prayer. Almighty God, thank you for these words, not my words certainly, but the words of Jesus Christ. Help us, Lord, to continue to be convinced in our own minds and hearts that just as Jesus looked at Peter and said, Peter, who do you say that I am? You also look at us and you want to know from us Will we make that same confession? Will we also say, Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. You are Messiah. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the challenge. Help us in humility to bow our knee and bow our heads. And as your disciples, share the prayer that you gave us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. God bless you, and um, until we see each other again face to face, uh, be healthy and be blessed.